Hello, everyone, and good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. And thank you for joining our last RC National Lecture of this summer, titled The Epigraphic Survey, RC and Kansu Temple, Collaboration and Ancient Secrets Revealed with Dr. Raymond Johnson. And I'm Dr. Louise Bertini, the Executive Director of RC, and I am so pleased to have you all with us today. Before we begin, a brief reminder that as this is our last virtual lecture of the summer, we want to thank you all for your continued enthusiasm and participation. We look forward to resuming our virtual lectures in the fall, so please stay tuned to your email and rc.org for more information. Also, please note that while the lectures hosted by RC National, like this one today, are paused for the summer, our chapters may have many virtual events throughout the summer. So I encourage you to visit our website and under the events section, you can view the calendar to learn more and participate in their programming. Today's lecture is a special edition and bringing attention to our continued work at Kansu Temple. As you know, we have been working to reach our goal of raising $11,500 to replace damaged cement and brick repairs with new sandstone. Today, I am thrilled to report that we have met this goal thanks to all of your generosity. And in spirit of that, we are launching a stretch goal of an additional $6,000 to produce a 3D fly-through video of the temple, ensuring we can bring Kansu Temple to life for anyone anywhere in the world. So I am thus honored today to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Raymond Johnson, director of the Chicago House. Dr. Johnson attended college at Tulane University in New Orleans and received his doctorate in Egyptian archeology span from the University of Chicago in 1992 with his dissertation entitled, An Asiatic Battle Scene of Tutankhamun from Thebes, a late Amarna antecedent of Ramesside battle narrative tradition. He has participated in excavations at the site of Fort William Henry in colonial Permaquid, Maine, at Chagumish, Iran, and at Kusser al Qadim on the Red Sea coast of Egypt and at Carthage, Tunisia. Dr. Johnson joined the epigraphic survey of the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago, based at Chicago House in Luxor, full time in 1979 as an epigraphic draftsman where he helped to document opet release of Tutankhamun in the Grand Colonnade Hall of Luxor Temple and began the Luxor Temple Fragment Project. He served as a senior artist from 1982, became assistant director in 1995, and was appointed director in 1997. He is a research associate professor of the University of Chicago's Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilization and of the Oriental Institute is project director of the Memphis Amenhotep III Reused Block Project, and currently directs the Amarna Talatat Project, where he is reconstructing wall scenes from stone monuments of Akhenaten and Nefertiti's cult city to the Aten. We are pleased to have Dr. Johnson with us today to discuss our shared work on Kansu Temple. And just before I turn it over to him, uh, as a little more background on Kansu Temple, uh, between 2006 to 2018, RC oversaw and executed conservation and documentation work in the temple via the training of 59 conservators from the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities with funding from the United States Agency for International Development. In addition to cleaning and conserving six chapels inside of the temple and two of the external facades, the project included structural repairs to stabilize the monument photographic documentation training school, and the introduction of visitor information and signage. RC began its floor restoration program at Kansu Temple as a follow-up to the USA dewatering initiative for Karnak and Luxor temples that began in 2006 with additional funding from USAID. Before 2006, the underpinnings of the temple were, in such, were so saturated with groundwater restoration and conservation was not feasible. However, within a few years of the area beneath the temple had dried out enough to allow much needed restoration. RC began its conservation and floor restoration program in 2008 
when drawings and plans from the Oriental Institute's publication were copied and used to plot conservation condition assessment and subsequent treatment by RC's conservation team. RC's floor restoration work required documentation component, and it was a natural fit for Dr. Johnson and his team at Chicago House to complete the work. Today, Dr. Johnson will focus on the collaboration between Chicago House and RC during the work that started in 2008. This work resulted in an astonishingly significant material being exposed for just enough time for Dr. Johnson and his team to record it before it was covered over with restoration stone. This marks a major chapter in Chicago House's documentation program at the Temple. So you are all in for a treat today to hear about this important work from Dr. Johnson himself. So with that, I will turn it over to you to take it over. Thank you very much, Louise, for that lovely introduction. And it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, as, she, as Louise said, I'll be talking to you about our collaboration with RC, but also the history of our epigraphic documentation uh, at the site of Kansu Temple. Oops, let's see. Now, of course, we are in Luxor, 400 miles south of Cairo. And the epigraphic survey, called by most people Chicago House, was established by the founder of the Oriental Institute, James Henry Breasted, in 1924. And our mandate was to continue the scientific recording of the uh, unrecorded and unpublished monuments in the Luxor area, of which there are quite a few, as you all know. We were originally set up on the West Bank in a mud brick dig house shown here. And we moved to a permanent facility, uh, thanks to the generosity of John D. Rockefeller Jr. and his family in 1932. And this is where we reside <clears throat> today. The landscape's changed a little bit. The Corniche has been cut away, uh, but we are still there. And many of you have uh, used our library facility during our uh, winter season, and you are welcome to continue doing so. We hope to be back this October, inshallah. Now, when our uh, concessions were first assigned to us in 1924, we were given the, the concession for the monuments of Ramses III in the Luxor area. These were um, covered with texts and reliefs that documented not only religious practices from antiquity, from the time of Ramses III, around 1100 BC, but also uh, historical documents and the architecture, again, tremendous preservation. So we, there were a number of, of sites in Luxor on the West Bank, of course, the great mortuary temple of Ramses III, where we began our work. And then uh, three sites on the East Bank in the Moot Temple complex is a very destroyed processional temple of Ramses III. In the first court at Karnak, another one that's much better preserved and then, of course, Kansu Temple, which was built by Ramses III as well. Now, we started our work at Medina Tabu, focused there, have produced more than eight uh, volumes of facsimile drawings of all the, the uh, hieroglyphic inscriptions and decoration inside and outside of the main temple proper and the high gates. And Kansu, we worked at uh, when we were in residence on the East Bank, when the Nile was still in flood at the beginning of our season, the team would work at Kansu Temple at Karnak and other parts of Karnak as well. Now, Kansu Temple in the Karnak complex is tucked away in the southern, the southwestern corner here. And I love this reconstruction painting by Jean-Claude Goffin of the Karnak complex as it looked in antiquity. And here it is here. You almost don't need a reconstruction though because Kansu Temple is one of the best preserved temples in all of Egypt. And it's a classic temple. It has all of the standard elements, the back sanctuary, a bark sanctuary, hypostyle halls, a court in front and even pylons. <clears throat> now we know that Ramses III began or, or did most of the construction of the temple, uh, but we know, also know that um, he did not, he only started the decoration on the inside chapels 
and um, his successors continued the decorative program inside. So there's still some question about did Ramses III actually finish the pylons in the front? Did Ramses IV finish? Uh, that question is still open, but Ramses III was responsible for doing most of the construction that we know, if not all of it. The decoration continued through the reigns of Ramses IV and Ramses XI and continued into Dynasty 21, where the, the great priest kings, Harry Hor and Panujum, uh, continued the decoration. There were renewals in the Ptolemaic and Roman periods, and then in its uh, later phases, the entire temple was used as the center of a medieval community and the hypostyle hall in the back was actually converted into a church. This is one of the reasons it's a very well-preserved monument. It continued to be utilized until modern times. Now, of course, Kansu was the son of Amun-Ra of Karnak and his wife, the mother goddess Mut. And Kansu goes back really to the beginning of things, the pyramid text where he's rather a violent God he has softened somewhat by the new kingdom when he is, his cult is celebrated here. He had a hawk head. Uh, he was the moon god. So his hawk head is surmounted by uh, the crescent moon and the lunar disc. And in some cases he is shown as the, the kind of a, the, the child of Amun and Mut with the side lock of youth and a, a sort of homage to his violent past. If you look closely at representations of his side lock, the bound tips are actually scorpion tails. So it shows that he is, you know, his, his ferocity is, is contained and pacified. And here we have Ramses IV in some of the most beautiful reliefs of Ramses IV in existence from the bark sanctuary uh, in the, uh, the back of the temple complex. Now, our epigraphic work began in 1935, uh, was uh, curtailed by World War II and continued until around 1948. In 1966, work resumed under Chicago House Director Charlie Nims, uh, and we concentrated on the photography and the documentation of the reliefs and inscriptions in the first court and the Hypostyle Hall, so the front parts of the temple. And we have plans, the, the plan is for us to go through the entire temple and publish with our, our facsimile drawings, uh, all of the reliefs and decoration throughout the complex. So that's, that's what our concession is for, only the epigraphic documentation. Um, I love this particular photograph of the 1973-74 field season. This actually comes from RC's archives and I'm not sure it may be a slide from Charlie Nims. But this shows our 1950 Chevy and some of the team doing the documentation work in the temple at that time. And I recognized one of the figures must be Jim Allen, who I know is one of the epigraphers during that season. So I wrote to him and I asked him if he could inform us about who else was in this photograph. And he remembered every single person, even the native workmen. I can hardly remember all the names of our own and, and some of our colleagues. So I'm incredibly impressed with Jim Allen's um, uh, incredible memory. Um, and one of the details he pointed out to me is that the headlights on the Chevy have been blacked out because of course this was just after the 1973 war. And so um, security measures were still in place, shall we say. Anyway, this is a wonderful historic photograph and we still have that Chevy. It's up on cement blocks in our back garage at Chicago House now. We produced two volumes of reliefs and texts in the first court and the Hypostyle Hall. And I know that many of you are familiar with our, with our publications. As Louise said, the drawings that we did were actually used within the conservation work that was done uh, early in RC's program there. Because one of the first things you have to do in conservation is you have to um, make condition reports are the reliefs flaking? Are they really, are they flaking here or there? We had ready-made drawings where all of the, the decay of the walls or, or the, the state of the walls could be document, documented right on our drawings. So they did uh, photocopies of, of our drawings and used that in the conservation work, which is very, which is very gratifying to see. 
the reliefs in the first court are extraordinary. The, the quality is sensational. Uh, painted plaster survives. We did some er, uh, cleaning early in our time there. Uh, RC's done more cleaning since then, and the details are just eye-popping. They're really quite, quite astonishing. I should mention at this point that these publications and all Oriental Institute publications and everything the epigraphic survey's ever done uh, all of our books are available in PDF format for free download from the Oriental Institute Publications website. And this is thanks to a gift that uh, Lewis and Misty Gruber made a number of years ago, which allowed the scanning of all of our publications. Everything we do now, we also do electronically. And when the hard copy books are released for sale, the uh, electronic versions are, uh, are released for free download. Second volume has to do with the Hypostal Hall. These are uh, reliefs of, of um, Ramses XI and the uh, Panogium with, I think, some uh, Ptolemy IV um, recarved doorways as well, all uh, mostly facsimile drawings with some photography. We have a third volume in the Kansu Temple series, and this was the uh, child of, of Helen Jacquet, who was extremely interested in the rooftop graffiti at Kansu Temple. Now, one of the things that we've learned is that, uh, and, and we, we don't have a lot of information because rooftops don't survive in most temples, but there are a whole series of, of uh, texts and inscriptions and graffiti that people, minor priests, individuals who serve the cult of Kansu, doorkeepers, priests, um, minor officials who had no tombs or elaborate tombs, they had no stele, they had no statues, they would go up to the roof of the temples they served and they would etch into the stone blocks uh, representations of, of their feet, for instance here, their sandals and they'd carve their names over them. And these feet stood in place, actually represented the individual and acted like a statue so that they would become a permanent part of the temple that they served and share the grace and the immortality of the, the deities within. And Helen was, was, was loved this material and made, uh, it made it her life study. And she actually, she had RC support for that. In fact, she was one of the first directors of RC way back when it was founded. And the feet that are that are carved on the on the roof uh, would sometimes take very simple form, just the outline of the sandals. In some cases, you actually had differentiated toes and toenails, which I think is really just very cool. And in some cases, this is one of my favorites. You had the sandal straps actually indicated as well. Uh, so you have all these different forms and the the texts, the names, the genealogies, these exist nowhere else. And Helen's publication represents a whole class of people that had no monument anywhere else. So it's, it, it shows the worth of the uh, documenting this, um, this material. And if we had more roofs that survived, we would be documenting a lot more of this and we'd have a lot more information. Tina DeCherbo and Richard Jazz now are doing the same sort of recording at Medina Habu on the roofs of the small Amun temple and the, um, the great mortuary temple of Ramses III where more texts of this sort survive. Very important. Now, one of the things that I personally love most about Kansu temple is the fact that Ramses III seemed to be in a bit of a rush when he constructed it. Um, it was constructed at the end of his reign, as I said. We don't know why he chose to do it to do this, but instead of quarrying fresh stone from Jebel Silsila and barging them up the Nile to uh, the Karnak site, uh, Ramses III dismantled a number of monuments and reused them, he reused the blocks in the construction of the temple. And you literally have stratigraphic levels of reused material in the temple. For instance, there are bits and pieces showing along the edge inscribed for Ramses the second, and I believe Horemheb and perhaps Seti the first. I remember Ed Wente was telling me he saw a block of Seti the first here. I could never find it. 
But then in the middle sections of the pylons and the, uh, the, the upper walls, the middle walls, you have uh, material that is very clearly from the I Horm Heb Mortuary Temple across the river. And then the upper levels on the roof line and the pylons themselves are, uh, are all blocks that were quarried from Amenhotep III's Mortuary Temple. And we know this because the texts on these blocks survive. And here is one of them now, um, one, a block of Amenhotep III uh, from his uh, Jubilee reliefs. And here you have, this is a, a Google, Google uh, map view of the West Bank. Here is the mortuary temple of Ramses III. And thanks to Piers Litherland for this, this image that he, that he made. You have his mortuary temple. When Ramses created his mortuary temple, he actually accommodated the, an earlier temple, the mortuary temple of Ai and Horemheb here. And then later on, it's very clear he took it down. So it's curious that he would accommodate it earlier and then choose to dismantle it later on, but he took this down. He took, it's quite possible, he disassembled the stone elements of the Amenhotep Senapapu Mortuary Temple because there's at least one block with Amenhotep Senapapu's name on it uh, in the back sanctuary area of Kansu Temple. And then um, he also, Ramses also dismantled the great um, forecourt, the peristyle court of Amenhotep III's mortuary temple behind the Colossi of Memnon. All of these are reused in the, throughout the complex. And we're just enormously um, lucky that the workmen who are working for Ramses III were under such pressure, they, they, they never erased any of the original decoration on the blocks that they used from these earlier monuments to construct Kansu Temple. And in most cases, they turned them in so you just couldn't see the decoration. But when the decoration was facing out, they slapped plaster over them and carved over the plaster, really thick plaster. Now, in some cases, the plaster's fallen away. And that's why some of our drawings look a little odd because you'll see have an offering scene here and then suddenly there's a battle scene uh, behind this uh, figure of the hawk-headed god. Uh, and over here, for instance, you have Kansu being worshipped. There was a figure of the king here in plaster that's fallen away. And this is an upside down sphinx base inscribed for Amenhotep III. Um, other examples are even more bizarre. You've got Kansu here, again, being offered to. Plaster's fallen away here. You have a block of Hormheb with his name, uh, part of a shrine scene, and then part of a battle-related scene, Nubian captives. And this block is completely upside down. And I remember when I was first looking at these, these plates, I just couldn't understand what was going on. And then, of course, realized in reading the text that these are reused blocks whose decorative surface has become exposed because the plaster's fallen away. So we included this in our, in our documentation of these scenes and represented them exactly as they uh, occurred on the walls. Now, this was particularly, this was very interesting for me doing dissertation research on uh, battle reliefs from the time of Tutankhamun from the Tutankhamun I Memorial Temple that I believe was Tutankhamun's mortuary temple. And then uh, at his premature death was converted into a memorial temple by I who associated himself with him. The closest parallel to the battle scenes that grace this monument are the Horemheb battle scenes. And I climbed all over the roof of Kansu, which we have not gotten to yet, uh, and found about a dozen blocks uh, on the roof area and in the pylon stairway that have a, uh, a number of, of uh, pieces of uh, very elaborate battle narratives showing Asiatic campaign, Nubian campaign, and a Libyan campaign from the time of Horemheb. So I documented all these for my dissertation as the closest parallel material. And we will eventually go back and continue the recording. As you can see, some of the blocks are turned in and rather hard of access. But as you'll see in a few minutes, we've developed some techniques to ferret out this information. So as Louise 
summarized, the uh, groundwater, groundwater lowering response project was the result of de dewatering programs for Karnak and Luxor temples that uh, were sponsored by USAID and activated in 2006. Later on, there was another one for the West Bank that was activated around 2011, 2012. And as she remarked, um, the foundations of Kansu Temple were always wet and the decay was just terrible in the lower walls and uh, column bases. And um, I remember R.C. asked the uh, Supreme Council of Antiquities at that time, what projects did they want to see happen in the Karnak area? And Kansu came up immediately because there are in every single part of Kansu Temple, in the first court here, there's pavement that's missing. In every single chamber, and you can see by this ground plan here where the, where the blocks, um, where the representations of the blocks stop, there are holes everywhere. In the medieval period, when the temple was used as the town of the small community, um, people actually lived in all of the sanctuaries, all of the chapels and the halls. And they knew from other temples that like Den Dendera and elsewhere, the late period temples had crypts underneath them that were sometimes filled with goodies. So the reason the floor blocks are all missing in, in every single chamber here is the, the locals were looking for stuff. And of course, they didn't find anything because in the time of Ramses III, there aren't crypts under the temples, but they didn't put the blocks back. So there are these huge holes everywhere. And it's a wonderful temple. And the ministry wanted, or the Supreme Council, of course, wanted to encourage visitors, but it was a little dangerous. So they suggested that flooring be um, restored to make, it, uh, uh, to make the visitors experience uh, safer and more pleasant and, and open up Kansu to, um, um, to visitors. So that's the, that's the story behind this. And as Louise said, by 2008, the ground had dried out enough because of this extraordinary dewatering program uh, that conservation and restoration work is now possible. And so it began. And in the cleaning of the areas, this is the first court where there was an enormous section uh, of blocks that were just completely missing this, this huge hole. And I'll remark on this a little bit later in the lecture, what we learned about that. Anyway, as they cleaned the area in preparation for stonecutter Danny Roy to be uh, placing restoration stone, uh, new paving stone, they realized that there were dozens and dozens, hundreds actually, of reused blocks in the flooring and the foundations that before now had been completely inaccessible. And the restoration process was going to make them even more inaccessible because they were going to be sealed over with huge sandstone blocks, which meant that you could not easily check these things again. So we were, we um, joined the RC team and um, the, the uh, documentation component of the project was done by us between uh, 2008. We continued after RC finished the flooring. So we, we worked in a little bit longer past 2015. Our team consisted of Inspector Gada, who has gone on to become a senior uh, senior inspector at Karnak now. She turned out to be a very, very uh, good artist. Um, Brett McLean, Jen Kimpton, uh, Kelly Alberts, artist, Christian uh, Vertesh artist. Um, Brett supervises all of the epigraphic documentation for the epigraphic survey as assistant director. And uh, uh, Jen, coordinated the um, numbering and the tracking of all the Kansu material. So this was, uh, this was essentially the team that worked at Kansu while the rest of our team continued work at Medinat Habu and Luxor Temple. The, the methodology for, for the documentation was pretty simple. RC's workmen um, under the supervision of John Sherman in this picture here, did the cleaning of the areas requiring uh, restoration. And when 
inscribed surfaces were found. Nothing else was done until we recorded it. Now, restoration work, this was a this was a limited time grant, and the restoration had to be done in a certain amount of time. So there were there were there were moments when we were fighting deadlines and begging for more time to do the documentation properly, but we had to modify our normal procedures in order to um, to get the documentation done that was necessary in this these this limited time. But uh, the, it was, we were assured that nothing would be would be hidden away until we had some form of documentation. RC uh, had a contract archaeologist, Pam Rose, who um, did the initial surveying of the material as it was uncovered and uh, measuring and archaeological archaeological recording this in the Hypostal Hall at Kansu Temple. Uh, we brought in our staff photographer, Yarko, when photography was possible, but in most cases, photography really wasn't possible um, because of the narrow spaces involved in this, uh, in the, uh, uh, the material. And so what we would do is we would, um, first we would make a very a preliminary tracing uh, uh, over the uh, inscribed surface. And because time was of the essence, I remember Christian and Kelly would take these tracings back home and then smooth out the lines at Chicago House, you know, make everything a little, a little more even, and then um, bring, the, uh, bring the tracings back to uh, Kansu Temple for collation in front of the block. And they, uh, Brett, Brett and Jen supervised the collation. Um, I would do a final review, and, and it was only after the, the tracings and blueprints of the tracings were collated at the site that the actual inking took place. Normally, we would collate ink drawings, and there just wasn't time for that. But this system actually worked out very well. And here I am doing a final check, and then always there was Danny and his assistants, in this case, Matthew, who were waiting in the wings with huge slabs that were going to go into place that would completely eliminate any possibility of uh, checking uh, checking um, these the inscribed material uh, after the restoration process. So we tried to we did the best job that we possibly could to make sure that our drawings were as accurate as possible in this short amount of time. Now, in some cases, the um, material really was in very hard to reach areas and we couldn't even trace it properly. Um, in this case, we utilized a technique that Will Schenk and I used in um, the uh, temple area of Memphis when we were recording reused blocks uh, in a Ramses II chapel outside of the Great Temple of Tot at Memphis. Uh, some of these blocks were underwater and you could, we couldn't trace them, we couldn't even see them because the, the swamp water was black. So we ended up using aluminum foil, we would make an impression, bring the aluminum foil up and then do a tracing of that. And this is what uh, Kelly is, is doing here in this, this, um, uh, this slide. We would slip the aluminum foil, we clean the area out very thoroughly, slip the aluminum foil in, use a long Q-tip to make a rubbing, pull the foil out, do a tracing of the foil and then, then do our collation and uh, final drawing uh, from, the, uh, from the foiling. And in this particular case, we really had a deadline uh, and Kelly worked into the evening uh, recording this and the next, the next day once it was finished, um, the slab that's waiting here was in place. No checking that drawing, but it's done. Other tight places, uh, this was an, uh, some of the material that came up was absolutely superb quality. And frankly, I found some of this earlier decoration to be much more interesting than the later decoration in the temple, but that's just, that's just my, you know, that's just me. Um, the, there is never any question about the worth of what we were doing because the information in this material turned out to be really quite extraordinary. So we ended up in the end, 
uh, by the end of the project, we recorded 765 blocks and fragments. 376 of those were in the flooring and foundations and still are. And 389 were loose blocks and fragments, which are stored in a number of the back chapels of the, uh, of the Kansu Temple. And it turned out to be a, an absolute treasure trove of data with lots of surprises, lots of unexpected information. For instance, it never occurred to me that we would find parts of the original Kansu temple that existed before the time of Ramses III in the foundation of Ramses III's temple, but there they were, of course, it makes perfect sense. Uh, we found a whole series of square pillars inscribed on four sides, uh, Thutmosed in style, the, um, the, the god in almost every case was falcon-headed, and in many cases, uh, you have the text actually indicating Kansu. So clearly, this is from an, uh, an 18th dynasty, the Thutmosed um, uh, Kansu temple that existed before the time of Ramses III. And in this particular case, we actually had a join between two blocks. You have to imagine these are two sides, two adjacent sides of a pillar and um, the figure of Khonsu here and hawk-headed Khonsu here, undoubtedly. Now we know it's Thutmosis III because we also found blocks with his name on them. So this is a lintel with Thutmosis III's uh, cartouches here, beautifully preserved. This is actually a threshold between two chapels. So you would walk on this even today when you go from one chapel to the other, not knowing these beautiful inscribed um, uh, sides on either side now uh, covered with restoration stone. It, it is pretty clear uh, from the material, the architectural preliminary architectural analysis of the material that the original Kansu temple took the form of the small almond temple from the same period, Thutmosis III, uh, Hatshepsut and Thutmosis III at Medinat Habu. And it is a type of temple that is very common throughout Karnak and uh, actually all through Luxor and, uh, and the area. So this was the first bit of very interesting information that, that we were able to glean. But we found all kinds of material, and most of this is in the back, in the back area, uh, underneath, in, underneath the flooring or in the flooring of the back sanctuary of Kansu Temple. Here is a block from Thutmosis IV, and you can see traces of his name here, Men Keperu Ra. Now, what's wonderful about this, it's wonderful enough that it's Thutmosis IV, and again, all, all this is sandstone. Um, Ramses II has not only usurped this, uh, he's punched his cartouche into Thutmosis IV's cartouche. Uh, Thutmosis IV's cartouche was in this lovely, beautiful, light raised relief. And of course, Ramses II's cartouche is in this heavy sunk relief. And um, while the decoration, the original decoration is still in raised relief, when um, Ramses II has appropriated it or usurped it, he has even recarved his face in some cases and pushed it, he's converted it into sunk relief. So we have this weird combination of raised and sunk relief in some of these blocks. I'll talk more about him in a moment. We also have Amenhotep III, again, offering lettuce to Amun Rakamutef here. We even have Akhenaten. We found one for sure Talatat that was used in the construction of the um, the porch leading into the Hypostyle Hall. And this is a photograph by uh, Owen Murray that uh, took place after our season. And it shows a, a little guy probably either bleeding a bovine or force feeding it. We have King I and texts of his that have been appropriated by Horemheb. Uh, many, uh, many of these are on architraves. And also, again, Ramses II has uh, further usurped it. So in, in the case of these two very busy drawings, you've got I's name surmounted by Horemheb's name. And then the final version is Ramses II, who has just punched it deep into the stone and the same here. So, and then uh, other 
other blocks of Horem Heb. And in this particular case, we were extremely fortunate that we have three blocks that join. They're inscribed on both sides. And um, interestingly, Horem Heb decoration uh, usurped by Ramses II, and the beautiful light raised relief of Horem Heb has been turned into sunk relief by Ramses II, which is something that he did throughout the Hypostyle Hall and elsewhere. So here we've got one side, it's actually a lintel over a doorway and then scenes on either side. Here is the other side. And this shows um, sunk relief lintel block that you can still see in the very back sanctuary at Kansu Temple. There's a, an opening where another block was removed. So this is this here. And then uh, one of the things that Jen did, another level of, of our documentation is um, she has made these very clever isometric uh, reconstructions showing in 3D how the blocks relate to each other. And so this is one side and this is the other side of that group. Now, what this tells us is there appears to have been a late 18th dynasty addition to the Kansu temple. Um, the, Reliefs all refer to Kansu again, uh, and, uh, but the scale is quite considerably larger. So the implication is that you had a Thutmose III sanctuary, a peripteral temple like at Medina Tabu, and then added on to that, probably the front is a, some sort of large hall, perhaps a court as well, uh, added during the reign of, of Ai. There is no trace of Tutankhamun so far, but it's quite possible that there, there, he might have been active there as well. But for sure, I and Horem have. Now, uh, uh, another wonderful, um, you know, the, the sorts of problems you encounter. We realized that some of that there were more um, reused blocks with original decoration showing in the upper walls of some of the chapels. So we. When we, when we noted them, we recorded them as well. And here Kelly is working on one that is an absolute wonderful brain teaser. The Ramses III decoration shows Ramses worshiping figures of seated Kansu here over the doorway. And this is, the, this is a black and white photograph of it. If you look carefully, you can see upside down ghost figures of an earlier text. So of course we recorded everything this is both sets, the Ramses, the, th the third decoration in raised relief and the sunk relief decoration as well. Here it is turned or uh, oriented toward the original Horemheb decoration. And then the final drawing shows just the, uh, the Horemheb um, architrave. So th this took some doing, I'll tell you, but you know, again, there's just all this information that's that's mm -hmm. there that is incredibly rich. So just beyond the 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 final Ramses III decoration on the wall, sometimes there are there are secrets hidden in the wall that you can't initially observe until you're literally right on top of it, like like Kelly was. The um, we have an incredible amount of SETI the first blocks as well, uh, including lintels offering scenes. I showed you a picture of this in the, in the crack in the, um, uh, between the, the floor blocks from the first court. What's very interesting is this material is all from the front of the temple. So this is in the, the foundations and the flooring of the front of the temple, primarily the, 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 the first court. And so the implication is that or one possibility is that Seti the first added uh, some sort of either court or possibly even a small pylon to the 18th dynasty Kansu temple. We're not entirely sure what's going on. Um, Amun is of course one of the, the main focuses, but Kansu is also a focus of, of these blocks. So we're still you know, trying to figure this out, but the, the quality of the carving is absolutely extraordinary as is the quality of the carving of the Ramses the second material. Now this is the corner of Chapel 7 down below. This is completely filled in and paved over now. 
And uh, there was no removing these blocks. These are literally foundation blocks and they are all uh, reliefs and inscribed for Ramses II. And you'll recognize this one. There's a very similar scene in the Hypostyle Hall of Karnak where Amun is seated over a representation of the Nile. Now, in most cases, or in many cases, we have Ramses II, who is re-carving some of the 18th dynasty decoration uh, on the block. So we sh I, saw that I showed you this one before. It's joined with uh, two other blocks. Here you've got Horemheb's name very clear with Ramses II's name punched into it. And this was originally all raised relief, and Ramses has made it into sunk. But there are original Ramses uh, decoration on, on some blocks that make one suspect that, like in many cases, like in the small almond temple at Medina Habu, where you had the Moses III doing the decoration inside the chapel, but there was no decoration on the outside of the chapel at Medina Habu. That decoration was added later on by Ramses III. So the outer pillars and the back sanctuary, the outer walls are all Ramesid decoration. But I suspect the same thing may have happened here. The original 18th dynasty temple had no decoration on the outside. It was all completely internal, but Ramses II added his reliefs to the, to the outside of it. At least that's one model that, that we're pursuing. Now there were, some more surprises, and this was this was the coolest of all. Um, deep in the foundations in the back sanctuary were a series of limestone blocks. Most were very rough. Um, they were about eight total, and I think six of them were had no decoration whatsoever. But two had the most astonishing decoration, and it was just completely unexpected. Um, the first block here shows a king and probably Kansu behind him, probably hawk-headed because the, uh, the, the level of the head. And he is uh, in a very 11th dynasty style. And uh, he is, uh, it's in a scene, the driving of the calves. There would have been calves out here because the, the king always has a special type of staff in this scene. But the second block, which is unfinished, uh, clinches it. It's the very, very bottom of the, the name of Kansu, who is in Thebes. Um, so what we have here, and you've got a part of a falcon here, you have two blocks that clearly are from a much earlier temple to the god Kansu, probably from Dynasty 11. And it's quite probable that where we found this block was actually the foundations of the Thutmose temple. So the sequence now is becoming clearer. There was at least by Dynasty 11, a temple to the god Kansu in this, in this spot. Um, Thutmose III, and possibly Hatshepsut dismantled that temple, used it in the foundations of uh, their sandstone temple. This is this is a very fine limestone. So this was this is an, the most wonderful piece of the puzzle of the history of Kansu Temple that we were not expecting to find, but we were absolutely delighted to find it. And the chances of finding part of Kansu's name here, it's, I just can't tell you what good fortune that is. So you never know what's going to come up. In summary, the, the material that we were able to record during this collaborative effort with RC uh, just explodes our knowledge about the history of Kansu Temple. We have found Thutmose III, Amenhotep II, Amenhotep III, Thutmose IV, Akhenaten, I, Horemheb, Seti I, Ramses II, Mirnepta, Seti II, everyone who came before Ramses III. And what's one of the more interesting things about where we found things, we found the earliest parts of the temple in the back part under the sanctuary. We found the later parts toward the front of the temple and we found the latest parts here. And it looks like Ramses III's workmen dismantled the back sanctuary of the original temple and reused them in the foundations of Ramses III's temple 
they dismantled the four areas and used them as the foundations for the temple here and probably dismantled the SETI the first material in the, uh, the, the front of the temple uh, for the foundations of the, the, the new four area of Ramses temple. So, you know, it makes sense that why drag these blocks any farther than you need to? They use them where they dismantle them. So we still have a bit of studying to do on this before we establish a, a firm chronology, but that's what it looks like to us at this point in time. And while I'm talking about the history of the complex, the use and reuse and the rebuilding and all, I have to mention, you know, we always wondered why the floor blocks were missing here in the court. Uh, no one was living here and it just seemed, you know, why would you create a hole in the middle of your entryway in, in the Middle Ages. And while we were working and while Arcy was working there, the SCA sponsored a cleaning project and a, a small excavation of this area. It made perfect sense to do so while it was open and exposed before the new paving blocks went in. And this was under the direction of our colleague, Momen El Saad, who is now one of the chief inspectors of Karnak. And they found a well not only did they find the well, there are steps going down to it. So that's why there's this hole there. The local community simply created a water source. They didn't have to go outside of the complex to get their water. And so that's why there was this big hole. And now that big hole is filled with beautiful paving stone done by uh, Danny Roy. And I'd like to acknowledge Danny Roy here. He passed away a few years ago. His, uh, his life was cut short tragically by cancer. And he was just one of the brightest lights that we've, we've ever had to work with. And I'm just very pleased that we had the experience of working with him at, at Chicago House and that RC had the experience of working with him at uh, Kansu as well. So I'd like to, that, that is my conclusion, and I'd like to thank the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities and the Supreme Council of, of Antiquities for the privilege of this extraordinary work in this extraordinary monument. And I'd also like my, my hats off to the Chicago House epigraphic team who did this work under sometimes should we say try, uh, trying challenging circumstances with the guns with the gun to the head? Um, they did the most phenomenal job of, of, um, of this salvage documentation, and now we're all the richer for it. So thanks to you, thanks for your attention, thanks to RC, thanks to everyone, and I'd be very happy to field any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you so much, Ray, for that absolutely wonderful presentation. Those Middle Kingdom blocks, I, uh, 11th Dynasty ones are really fabulous. Yeah, and 11th Dynasty, it's a guess, stylistic guess. Uh, could be a little bit later, but they sure look 11th to me. Anyway, the jury's still out on that. <laughs> anyway, we have a few questions that we'll take. Uh, so the first question that we have um, is could the dismantled temple have been used because they were damaged by an earthquake or have I got the wrong date for the big quake? Um, you know, I'm not entirely sure when Herig believes the earthquake did the damage in the Memnon temple, but I, I'm not entirely sure. I think that it, it, it that it happened by the time of Ramses III. So that is one possibility. You also have to remember that the Memnon temple was partly in the cultivation and so it was subject to flooding as well. And the foundations of the peristyle court in particular were ridiculously thin. So there was probably collapse uh, for sure. What's interesting is the cult of Amenhotep III seems to be revived around the time of Ramses III, which makes no sense to me at all if he's dismantling the mortuary temple. But it appears that the sanctuary of Amenhotep III's mortuary temple perhaps was revived and continued functioning. It was only the peristyle court that was removed in front of it, which had jubilee reliefs and some also some wonderful reliefs in a very Amarna-esque style in sunk relief that um, 
are still very mysterious, but seem to be dated to Amenhotep III. Those are all peppered throughout Khonsu Temple as well. That's the subject of another lecture altogether. And as far as the other temples go, the, the Mortuary Temple of Ai and Horemheb and uh, the Amenhotep son of Hapu, it's a bit of a mystery is why, why he chose to dismantle them because they were perfectly sound as far as we can tell. And the cults were continuing at that time as well. Amenhotep son of Hapu, was, uh, his fame was increasing as time went by. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a big question. Why did Ramses III decide to, to completely redo Khonsu Temple at the end of his reign? What, what, and why the rush? And it's kind of ironic here, he's rebuilding from scratch the temple of the son of Amun and Mut. And at Medina Habu, one of his own children ends up assassinating him. Ironic. Didn't work. Whatever he was trying to do, it didn't work. <laughs> um, a question from Susan. Can we tell whether Kansu Temple foundations were waterlogged from the start? Um, a deliberate choice to associate it some way with the primeval mound. I think it's partly well, been answered. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, there, there was increasing groundwater levels because of increased irrigation around Karnak in modern times. When the Aswan Dam was activated in the late 60s and irrigation was possible all year round, the, the water table rose accordingly because of course irrigation water drains to the Nile and passes under Karnak. So there was more water there. But you have to remember that in antiquity, of course, the Nile flooded every year. Everything was flooded uh, in the foundation. Sometimes there was standing water in Karnak itself. So there's always this contact with primeval waters during the flood anyway. So there, uh, the Kansu and all of Karnak were always subject to some, some sort of water and decay. We know that there was patching done along the outside of uh, all the monuments at Karnak in the Ptolemaic and Roman periods. But yes, there, yes, water is a very important symbol uh, and iconographical device during this this time, and definitely part of part of all temple programs. A uh, question from Frederick. Uh, who is asking about, you mentioned uh, a lot of the different kings who have been uh, identified throughout your work at the temple. Um, what about Tutankhamun? We didn't find anything specifically uh, for Tutankhamun. Now, we did find I and Horemheb, Horemheb over I and Ramses II over Horemheb. I never appropriated anything of Tutankhamun's, but he very often continued work that Tutankhamun started. For instance, you know, the sphinxes between the 10th pylon and Mu temple, they are partly inscribed for Tutankhamun, the bases, and then the other half are inscribed for I. So we know I continued projects and it's probable. My suspicion is that, you know, we, we had access to a very small percentage of the area the, the, the uh, foundation area of Kansu Temple, only where restoration was going in. But my suspicion is the Tutankhamun was probably active there as well. We just did, we did not, we personally did not find any reused material that was inscribed for him. A uh, question from Emily, uh, how can you tell which horn had blocks came from the West Bank and which are original to the Hormheads expansion of the 18th dynasty Kansu temple? That's an easy one because the, um, the Hormheb blocks from the original Kansu temple were found in the flooring and foundations of the temple. The Hormheb, the I Hormheb mortuary temple blocks are found in the middle to upper walls of the Kansu temple. So they're, they're in two totally different areas, which is great. <laughs> uh, 
And also, it's pretty clear because many of the um, Horemheb architrave blocks, I Horemheb architrave blocks, do refer to Kansu. So the texts also give us that information, but they seem to be two areas, two separate areas for the, the different sets of blocks. But that is a good question, and it is something we have to definitely keep our eyes open for. A question from Amr. Uh, what is the resource of the new block used for the pavement, pavement uh, floor in the restoration work? I believe Danny had the the restoration paving stones quarried from Silsila, Jebel Silsila, where the original blocks came from. Originally, <laughs> quarried by Ramses III's predecessors, almost all the sandstone used at Karnak comes from Jebel Silsila and the West Bank. Uh, we have two more questions. Oh, another one just popped up, uh, a third one. <laughs> um, from Mary, did the artisans use some sort of high relief or sunken relief to change a cartouche? Um, well, it depends on who the king is. Uh, Ramses II clearly used a very deep cut sunk relief and he punched it right through raised relief when he found it. He didn't bother to try to um, redo the cartouches in, in raised relief. Um, Harm Heb is often a little more subtle. He, when he changes eyes cartouches to his own, usually he, try, he does it in the same relief. So if it's sunk relief, he does it in sunk relief. If it's raised relief, he'll do it in raised relief. It depends on the king and the circumstance. A question from Patricia. Uh, with regards to the reused block from Amenhotep, son of Hapu's temple, is it possible to tell which area of the temple the block came from? The block that I know of is in one of the very back sanctuary rooms. It's actually sanctuary, it's room eight, chapel eight and it's embedded in the wall. And it seems to be like a filler, a filler stone, but it, Amenhotep, son of Hapu's name is very clear. That is the only one I know of. And I have, I've read of others, of other blocks of Amenhotep, son of Hapu known in the literature, but I've not, I do not know of them. I only know of this one. So it's a munkin, it's a possibility. That, that his mortuary temple is, is um, reused in Kansu Temple. We did not find more evidence of that where we were working. And again, it doesn't mean that it's not there. It's just we weren't, um, we did not have access, access to it. But it is interesting. He is definitely there with this one inscribed uh, block fragment. Uh, a question from Amira. Was it common for later medieval villagers to live within ancient temples or was there something that might have drove them there? I think it was really convenient. It's a wonderful human size, a great place to live. I'd live there if I could. Um, but you'll, you'll find that in the Middle Ages, most of the temples uh, up and down the Nile Valley were inhabited. They had settlements inside and around them and on top of them. Luxor Temple, you know, Edfu is a classic example. Um, they were a, a, a great, you know, refuge and very handy and huge. They could accommodate a lot of people. So you'll find that it is actually common uh, for settlements to grow in and around the, the abandoned temples. A question from Greg, was any preservation methods employed for the inscriptions in the foundation before the restoration stones were placed in position? I believe that clean sand was placed over everything. And that is, it's the simplest but uh, most effective way to protect the inscribed material down below. It's, it allows uh, moisture to pass through 
it doesn't you know percolate and create a microclimate uh, so everything was filled in with sand there may have i forget exactly what danny did this was a while ago i'm not sure if there was any you know um anything else done or not but I'm, i i know for for sure that the sand was a major component there A uh, question from Anne, do you think the orientation of the temple was always the same or might it have been slightly re relocated? Well, you know, that's actually a very interesting question because we did note some of the foundation stones were slightly off axis for Kansu Temple. In other words, the Kansu Temple was a certain axis but then we were seeing foundation walls that seemed to be slightly, just a little off. So I always wondered, and we, did, we just didn't have enough information to be able to say for sure, are these the original foundations of the 18th dynasty Kansu temple or not? We, we really weren't supposed to be doing any excavation back there or any, any cleaning other than it, in preparation for a new new stone going in. So it was, we had to sit on our hands sometimes because we, there could have been a lot more investigation done, which did not happen. Uh, but yes, so I, I think that the orientation of Kansu Temple was roughly the same, may have been off a few degrees, because I do think we were seeing foundations that, foundation stones that were from the 18th dynasty temple. And the limestone uh, blocks were in some of those. So that made me think that um, it was part of the, the reuse in the time of Thutmose the third. And our very last question uh, coming from Sid, uh, how far along the track of the grand uh, Chicago house epigraphic project are you now? Oh, you mean, when are we gonna finish? <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're never going to finish because there's always new stuff coming up. Um, we now have projects at Luxor Temple, at Medina Tabu, at Kansu Temple, and we took on a, um, a, um, a tomb on the West Bank, TT-107, back in the time of Kent Weeks. Um, it's all salvage work, I mean, really. So there... You know, I spend a good part of my time, as you know, Louise, raising money to support the team we have, trying to expand it. Um, let's just say, I can't tell you when we're gonna be finished. In fact, I don't think we're ever gonna be finished. <laughs> but, but that's okay. We, you know, we're, we're doing our best and making inroads every year. We're, well, stretched, I, we're stretched a little thin, that's my fault, but we are stretched a little thin. Well, I think there's always more to learn and uncover in Egypt, and that's what just makes it such a fascinating oh, yeah. country to work in. Yeah. Um, so, Ray, I want to thank you so much for your absolutely fascinating lecture, and I want to thank all of our members um, for joining us today. And, of course, the work that we do is all made possible because of supporters like you. And I also want to thank everyone who has contributed uh, philanthropically to our project. Um, it is hugely motivating and inspiring to know that we all share the same goals in completing uh, the project of the conservation and preservation of this very important monument. And thanks to the generosity of so many, we have met our goal um, to replace the damaged cement and uh, brick repairs with new sandstone. And I want to thank you all who have helped to make this possible. And as mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, today we will be launching a stretch goal of an additional $6,000 to support production of a fly-through video of the temple. So you all will be able to virtually experience what you have all heard about today. And it is important now more than ever that while we conserve these sites in real time and space that we also provide digital access so that anyone can explore the wonders of this temple. You can find out more information on how to support this project by going to our website rc.org or click the link in the box and I think that Courtney should be popping in a link where you can make a gift today. So thank you again Dr. Johnson on for all of you for sharing your weekend with us and we hope to keep you updated on the progress via newsletters and of course our website 
And I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. <laughs>